It's that time of year again. The time to sit on your ass and watch a whole bunch of Christmas specials on the TV. Whether you celebrate or not, you might as well tune in because it's not like there's anything else on. But Lee, I have so much to get done. If I don't bake 10,000 cookies by Christmas Day, they're gonna close my family's beloved small town country store, which I recently came to appreciate after leaving my high paying office job in New York City. How on earth am I gonna have time to figure out which Cartoon Network Christmas specials to watch? <laughs> Oh, don't you worry, Tiny Lee. That's exactly why I've brought us together today. Yippee! We are going to be taking a look at 36 Christmas specials made by or frequently broadcasted on Cartoon Network and decide which ones are worth your time and which ones ought to be chucked into that cozy Yule Log fire. Today's Christmas Specials Christmas Special has been brought to you by Cool Shirts. Hey, maybe you've got a bit of extra money due to unspecified winter holiday. May I suggest you spend it on a cool shirt? I'm not kidding when I say that my stuff from Cool Shirts is the most fun, most comfortable, and highest quality clothing that I own. Just compare the thickness of this generic non-Cool Shirt to the highly supreme Cool Shirts material. The Cool Shirt I'm wearing today is the Violence Tee, for when you feel immense rage but are just so dang cute at the same time. Incomprehensible violence! None will remain! <laughs> oh, Murder Bear, you're always saying those things. I must enact my dark urges! Bring me prey! No, Murder Bear, we've got to review all of these Christmas specials first. I need blood! I need flesh! I demand... <laughs> That's enough out of you, silly goose. My viewers can get 10% off if they use the link in my description. That's shirtswithaz.cool slash leespeaks and use the code leespeaks. Get your own Murder Bear today! Please, if I don't propagate his spawn, I'm going to be next. Please! Alright, there are some things that I need to establish before I begin. First of all, I will not be attempting to make this even a little bit objective. Even though I think that writing an objective review is about as possible as dividing by zero, I will not even be paying lip service to the possibility that this could be. This will be sheer opinions-based, feelings-based shenanigans. Therefore, if you know that you tend to get very upset at hearing opinions different from your own, I suggest you click off the video and... Wait, no. I suggest that you stay and watch the entire thing till the very end and get very, very angry with me. And leave me several angry comments and perhaps share this video to tell everyone how mad you are at it. And that way, YouTube will be more likely to show this video to a bunch of other people who are also going to get mad at me. Please and thank you. Second, I will not be covering every Christmas special that has ever appeared on Cartoon Network, and this is simply because I do not want to. Exclusions include specials released before 1999 and after 2012. Anything that I couldn't find footage to edit this video with. Anything that didn't show up on any of the lists that I reference and therefore I don't know about. And anything that I simply couldn't be bothered to watch. To minimize hurt feelings, I will not be clarifying which exclusions apply to which specials. So if I'm skipping one that you really love, just tell yourself I couldn't find the file. Maybe it's true. Now let me establish what, for the purposes of this video, makes a good Christmas special. First and most importantly, it's got to feel like Christmas. It's got to be joyful, it's got to be festive, whether or not they're actually celebrating literal Christmas, it has to capture the feeling of the winter holidays. And second, it helps if it feels like an event. It's alright if they treat their Christmas special like any other episode, but it feels a lot more impactful if the episode is a hard hitter. Bonus points for being longer than a standard episode or including an important plot moment. Other things that help it in the ranking include being functional as a standalone episode and not requiring a ton of context from the rest of the series, being well written, well paced, well animated, or a combination of all three, and of course being an episode from a show that I already like. And finally, let me introduce my seasonally appropriate ranking method. The Ranking Tree. I've made ornaments to represent each one of the 36 specials I'll be covering today, and we'll be ranking them higher or lower on the tree, depending on how it holds up to that Christmas special quality metric that I just mentioned. And at the very end, I'll designate one of these specials to be the shining star at the top of the tree. I don't necessarily expect a lot of these to be very bad, but due to the fact that there's more lower branches than there are higher ones, even if it's hung pretty low, interpret that as more of a lower middle tier than bottom tier. It's only really bad if I specifically call it that. I'll be going over these specials by year of release, but prioritizing flow of viewing over being strictly chronological. 
And with that, let's waste no time and dive into the Christmas specials of 1999, beginning with Olive the Other Reindeer. Matt Groening? I didn't know that. All of the Other Reindeer is an adaptation of a picture book of the same name featuring the titular Olive, a Christmas-loving dog. This is a 3D animated movie using flat cutouts for the characters a la Parappa, and it's honestly pretty impressive that the CG looks as good as it does for a TV movie from 1999. However, the character animations have this overly smooth tweening look that can tend to be a little unsettling. The plot of the movie gets kicked off by Olive being gaslit by her pet flea. They listen to a radio announcement that says Blitzen the reindeer has been injured and that Santa will have to make do with all of the other reindeer. She hears this correctly, but the flea insists that it said Olive the other reindeer. When her owner comes to apologize for being impatient with her earlier, the flea insists that he's actually saying that he's tired of her and wants to get a new dog. Give this bastard a slice of next guard pie. We get a villain song from this postman who hates the holidays because he's overworked. When Olive goes to take a bus to the North Pole, he tries to arrest her for mail fraud, but gets intercepted by her new friend, the scammer penguin Martini. Olive and Martini head up to the North Pole together and engage in some wacky hijinks as the postman tries to stop her from getting there, including her escaping from this mail truck by getting a metal file sent to her from Deus Ex Machina. She encounters some flightless reindeer who she encourages with a pep talk and... When you're this far north with no sunlight, sometimes tempers fray. Oh my god, this guy's voice sounds so familiar. Oh my god, it's Michael Stipe! Employment in these latitudes. That's me in the spot. Like losing my religion. Olive arrives at the North Pole and convinces Santa that she can help him fly the sleigh. And it's a little shaky at first, but it turns out that she actually can fly. However, the postman switches out his mail bag for Santa's present bag, so they have to go get their stuff back and also rescue Martini. This postman is voiced by Dan Castellaneta, and sometimes the Homer jumps out. What will you do now? Uh, you know, I'll do a little loan shark and sell a little Amway. Just some casual multi-level marketing humor for your Christmas movie. The day is saved, they deliver the presents, they sing a little song. Olive reunites with her owner and they celebrate Christmas. Martini decides to turn his life around by becoming a mailman, while the postman fills in for Martini as a penguin at the zoo. This is one of the first movies that people associate with Cartoon Network Christmas specials, and I think that's for good reason. You can sense the Matt Groening DNA in this one in everything from the voice cast to the snappy writing, and the visuals, while primitive, are a pretty solid adaptation of the book. This adaptation adds a lot more to the story than the book has, because the original doesn't really have enough content for a full movie. For example, Martini the Penguin was present in the book as a nameless extra, and the postman was invented whole cloth since the original story didn't have an antagonist. Wait, can I just point out how the villain in this movie is an overworked, exploited man who's just struggling to put food on the table and only wants to cancel Christmas so he doesn't have to work so goddamn hard? Like, because he has a chronic injury due to overexertion and doesn't want it to get any worse? Maybe he ought to have put his time and energy into unionizing instead of trying to sabotage a dog, but honestly... Olive is an enemy of the working class, and so is Santa. I like this movie, it gets a high placement. Next, Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. This movie opens with the titular Grandma getting run over by a reindeer. We just leave her there and flash back to the past. We meet the Spankenheimer family, who runs this old-timey Christmas store in the middle of a big city, including the ludicrously sexy Cousin Mel. For some reason, basically every woman in this movie is double-cheeked up and busty, including Grandma. Predictably, since they have a little building in the middle of a big city, one of the major conflicts is that they refuse to sell out to this sinister land developer. Mel, however, tries to push them into going forward with the sale. Bye-bye. <laughs> I've always loved a man in tights. Cousin Mel's voice lines are just absolutely wacky. Due to being based on a folksy Christmas song, this movie has several musical interstitials that emulate the style of the original song, and they are just so relentlessly surreal that they sometimes make me feel like I'm hallucinating. After Grandma puts the young boy Jake to bed, she gets run, run over, over by, by a reindeer, reindeer, and he's a witness. He tries to tell his family, and they all think that he's gone insane. The police inspect the scene of the collision and... Into. Oh yeah! What? Why is this movie? Grandma is just straight up gone now. Months pass, and they all just start assuming she's dead. Cousin Mel tries to sell off the store, but her name isn't on the deed. She starts the process of transferring ownership, and it seems like Grandma and Grandpa are their legal names. There's another random musical interstitial where Grandpa sings about Grandma being dead. Yeehaw! Jake tries to stop the business handoff, and the developer gives him one week to find Grandma, and so he sends an email to Santa. 
There's yet another baffling voice performance here from Santa. If I could make just one stinking person who understands the holidays are about human kindness with only a touch of conspicuous consumption. They've got Grandma in their infirmary and she can't remember who she is. And this version of Santa is just alarming. Jake reunites with his grandma, and surprise, surprise, she has no idea who he is. He brings her back to his hometown to prevent the business from being sold off. Santa explains to the big boss guy what happened, and the developer agrees to call off the sale. However, grandma wanders off in the meantime, which causes Santa to get arrested. And then we get the most iconic scene in this whole movie. Grandpa's gonna sue the pants off of Santa. That's what grandpa's gonna do. What the hell are these backing vocals? He knows the law is on his side. On his side. Santa's going for a ride. Oh my. So, if the beard fits, you must convict. Some casual O.J. Simpson trial humor for your Christmas movie. Jake gets Grandma to remember everything by giving her some fruitcake. Just as Santa is about to be declared guilty, they show up and present all the evidence. And are they implying that Cousin Mel set this all up from the beginning? As in, she accounted for the existence of Santa and flying reindeer in hopes that they would kill Grandma? <laughs> this movie is so goddamn baffling in every way. As the movie is ending, Grandma's holding the tainted fruitcake again and yet again gets run over by a reindeer. I cannot pretend this movie is good. Yes, it is camp. It is undeniably camp. But dear god, it is just so unhinged. The voice work, the writing, the off-the-wall pop culture references, it is just pure, unadulterated lunacy. However, this one doesn't fall to the bottom of the tree because it is so ludicrous that it becomes extremely fun to watch. Especially after you've had some nog. A truly irredeemably bad special would have you wanting to change the channel, but Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer is captivating, even though it's not quite like this. Yay! Christmas! And more like this. What? This one gets a lower middle branch. Next up, 12 Tiny Christmas Tales. Oh man, now that's one hell of a frame rate. Bill Plimpton's hand-drawn colored pencil art style is very charming and adorable, but in comparison to some of his better known works, it gets stretched pretty thin here. There's a lot of moments where the extremely vivid gestures contrast harshly with the amount of movement being shown on screen, and I suppose whether that's a good or bad thing is up to your own discretion. I can't complain too much because the special was animated entirely by one person. Like the name implies, we get 12 little Christmas tales framed as this grandma telling stories to a group of kids. Oh god. There's a story about a Christmas tree, a story about a snowman who finds love. God, these children are scary. There's a story about Blitzen doing stand-up comedy, there's an adaptation of The Twelve Days of Christmas where the receiver only gets birds, a sprig of mistletoe has an existential crisis, there's a snowflake murderer, as in a snowflake who murders people, there's a story about the tie from Disco Elysium, a dancing bear trying to cheer up a king, a boy who celebrates Christmas every day of the year except on Christmas, a peddler who gets knocked into the air and causes the legend of Santa Claus, a present that falls out of Santa's sleigh and has to make its own way under the tree, and finally, a dog Christmas caroler. In real life, this cat is trying to get at the bird in the cuckoo clock. This one grew on me the more that I watched it. Its art style is just adorable and harkens back to a more mid-century animation style despite its premiere in 2001. The little stories feel like short-form comic strips set to motion and are occasionally very funny and always charming. I wasn't expecting to like this one as much as I did, but it's definitely an underrated Cartoon Network Christmas classic. This one gets a high spot on the tree. Next, a Johnny Bravo Christmas. Johnny's mom is making him clean up, and while he's at it, he realizes he forgot to mail their letters to Santa Claus, jeopardizing his free Christmas gifts. He goes to the post office and asks them to get the letter there tonight, which makes literally everyone mock him. He decides to take matters into his own hands and hand deliver them himself. Susie claims to know Santa's address and offers to tell him on the condition that he take her with him. They sneak themselves on to a fully booked flight by hiding in the baggage compartment. They nearly get caught, but some circus animals provide a distraction by roasting the guard. We get what I believe is our singular direct reference to the story of Jesus Christ in this whole lineup. Christmas is a time to celebrate the birth of baby Jesus! Susie frees them all as thanks, but they accidentally open the cargo door during their celebration. The animals go free... Bye bye Try not to get shot! And Johnny and Susie are stuck without a way to get to the North Pole. Susie summons a trucker, and we get our standard Johnny Bravo gets beaten within an inch of his life by a hot girl sequence. They get dropped off at an airport and find a sketchy pilot who's willing to take them to see Santa. 
On the way there, they realize that the address that Susie has is a fake, but are quickly distracted by celebrity Mormon Donny Osmond smacking into their windshield. He forces them into a musical number and reveals that he has the address that they need, but the pilot got too distracted by the whimsy and nearly crashes the plane directly into Santa's village. Johnny realizes as he's delivering the letters that all of the things his mom asked for were actually for him, and changes his mind and asks for the remaining available presents to be for her instead. Santa agrees and fixes their airplane too. After they're back, Johnny apologizes to his mom, and everyone in town shows up to throw a Christmas party to celebrate Johnny's generous decision. This episode was pretty hit or miss for me. A lot of it I found bizarre and less of a haha cartoon funny type way and more of a I don't understand the point of this being included type way. And the Osmond cameo just leaves me cold, except it was kind of funny when Santa didn't recognize him. I don't hold any great affection for Johnny Bravo, and I can't pretend that this doesn't contribute to my lukewarm view of this one. I think this episode goes on a lower middle branch. Next, Totally Spies Ho 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 No. This one opens up on the group having a secret Santa gift exchange. While the other two get cool presents, Clover gets a box of coal. Turns out their rival Mandy was her secret Santa. Clover is extra mad because she was Mandy's secret Santa and put aside their history to get her a nice gift. But Sam was also Mandy's secret Santa. And Alex was also Mandy's secret Santa. And so were a bunch of other people. Before they can deal with this, they get sucked up on a spy mission to go deal with an unidentified flying object around Beverly Hills. At first, they think it's just a simple weather balloon, but they change their mind after it shoots their helicopter out of the sky. After they're back on the ground, they realize that everything is covered in snow. They try to call Jerry, but the signal is too scrambled, so they have to drive there. And then we get an accurate depiction of Californians trying to drive in a blizzard. They first have to identify the substance of the snow. Jerry's testing tool ruined the sample, but Clover identifies the type of designer water used with a single taste. Turns out that a disgruntled mall Santa stole a bunch of water to cover SoCal with snow to get back at the general public for... not caring enough about Santa, I guess. They have a mid-air ice battle and successfully take down the snow balloon. No! Not my weather balloon! They apprehend wannabe Gilbert Gottfried and the city goes back to normal. As far as Totally Spies episodes go, this one was A-OK, -okay, but looking at it from the lens of a Christmas special, this one just doesn't have that magic touch. It's way more about the crappy weather than it is about any holiday, and the only real Christmas moment that we get is this little gift exchange at the beginning of the episode. Since it rates poorly on that most important metric, feels like Christmas, this one's going on a lower branch. Next is Scooby-Doo Christmas. A group of kids stumble upon a giant snowman in the middle of the forest, and it turns out to be the Headless Snowman, a local legend. Mystery Incorporated are struggling to travel on the icy roads and get blocked from their destination by a collapsed bridge. They backtrack to the last town, a place called Winter Hollow, where they refuse to celebrate Christmas due to the yearly terror of the Headless Snowman. They stop at the local inn, and the owner has sinister eyebrows. His business is benefiting from the snowman destroying houses situation, which quickly makes him a suspect. The only room available is a tiny storage closet, which Daphne instantly remodels into a spacious hotel room. And they say she's the weakest member of the group. This girl can bend space to conform to her will. The headless snowman strikes again, and so the gang decides to go looking for it. Christmas-themed monster hijinks ensue. A professor and expert on local history shows up and tells them about the snowman's ghostly legend. You definitely can't fault this episode for not being Christmassy enough, because they manage to sneak a Christmas pun into nearly every line. How's that sound? Like, ho, ho, horrible! They do the running around chasing each other thing, but extra winter themed. Shaggy and Scooby freeze to death in a frozen pond. Am I glad he's frozen in there and that we're out here and that he's my sheriff and that we're frozen out here and that we're in there? They head back to the inn and discuss the suspects. That night, the headless snowman strikes and goes after Shaggy and Scooby. The rest of the team sets a trap to melt the snowman, which is revealed to be piloted by the professor. But everyone feels really bad for him, and they decide not to arrest him despite the fact that he's made nearly an entire town homeless in the middle of winter. The whole town celebrates Christmas together, and it's all very merry. I'm not really partial to any iteration of Scooby-Doo, but I thought this Christmas special was pretty cute. It was just so over-the-top, ridiculously Christmassy that I have to respect it. It was truly the most Christmas that a Christmas episode could possibly be, and it was honestly pretty light on the typical Scooby-Doo trope scenes. For that, a Scooby-Doo Christmas goes on a pretty good level branch. Next, Christmas con carne. Remember this weird little sister series to the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy? This one brings us a bite-sized Christmas episode of only seven minutes. 
The evil Concarne group attacks Santa and places the brain of Hector Concarne on his head, which takes over his body. A snowman witnesses this happen and reports to Rupert the Green-Nosed Reindeer, who is initially dismissive but takes the opportunity to become a legendary figure by saving Christmas. He said the strange boss would go away with time. You don't know how relieved I was some casual venereal disease humor for your Christmas episode. Rupert begs Santa to resist Hector's mind control, and he succeeds and fights back against the team of villains. However, they run off with Santa's sled loaded with mind-controlling toys. Rupert gets on board and beats everyone up and retrieves the sleigh. The evil Concarne group gets coal in their presence for the rest of their lives. I think this episode being so itty-bitty is a point against them for the purposes of this list. It was pretty funny, pretty charming, but there's just so little to work with, and we see so little of the main characters and so much of this jacked reindeer. This one's going lower on the tree. Next, the Powerpuff Girls twas the fight before Christmas. The version I found of this one was a TV broadcast rip, and so it came with all the ads of the original airing. I'll try to not let this affect my judgment of this special, but honestly, it does add a lot. Like, look at this charming stop-motion animation for That's What I Call Christmas. The Powerpuff Girls are discussing their Christmas wishes, and Princess shows up and establishes herself as the villain for this episode. The other girls inform her that she's been too naughty to get any presents from Santa, citing all of her various Villain of the Week episodes. She attempts to rant about this to all of her family staff, but all of them agree with the Powerpuff Girls' assessment. Turns out she's been getting coal in her stocking for years. In all these years, I thought that coal in my stocking came from Daddy's coal mine! And decides to take revenge against Santa. Meanwhile, the Powerpuff Girls engage in a super-powered Christmas decoration montage, but even their powers can't prevent the lights from shorting out. Princess arrives at the North Pole and does some ninja <laughs> to infiltrate Santa's office, and discovers that she is literally the only one on the naughty list. She reverses the titles of the lists and takes her leave. Bubbles wakes up in the middle of the night and goes downstairs to look for signs of Santa's visit, and realizes that all three of them got coal. She looks around the neighborhood to find that everyone else has the exact same issue. She wakes up her sisters, and they resolve to go fix things. As they're flying out, they encounter Princess, now with Powerpuff Girls' powers. They chase her all the way to the North Pole, and Jessica Simpson has a Christmas album. Some other highlights from the ads, Walmart still had these creepy mascots, Wally and Marty, and this goddamn pigeon movie. Back to the chase sequence, Buttercup finally knocks Princess out of the sky with a well-aimed snowball. They all realize where they are and race to talk to Santa before their rivals can, leaving a path of destruction in their wake. When Santa finds them, he's already impatient with them because he's upset with the world's kids for being naughty. Princess can't help but throw a fit and verbally abuse Santa, which sells her out as the one who switched the naughty and nice lists. He puts her on the permanent naughty list, along with several references to creators of the show. Princess's powers get revoked as she's flying back to tell her dad, and Santa gets discouraged about re-delivering the presents when he realizes that his sleigh is smashed. The Powerpuff Girls deliver the presents themselves, and when they get back home, they're too tired to open presents with the professor. But they change their mind. This special hits every single one of the marks that it needs to. It's the Powerpuff Girls at its very best. It's double length to really feel like an event. It's an important moment in the series, as only one of two episodes where Princess Morbucks actually gets Powerpuff Girls powers. It's so damn funny and so damn memorable, and so relentlessly stylish in the way that only the Powerpuff Girls is. And most importantly, it feels like goddamn Christmas! All the 2000s era Cartoon Network Christmas ads around this recording really drive that home, but even without them, it's simply Christmas as all get out. This one is going near the top of the tree. It's becoming extremely cold in this basement that I record in, and I can't turn on the heat because then the fan sounds would drown out my voice, so it is blanket time. How cozy is that? Next, A Christmas Dinosaur. I had never heard of this one before making this list, so apologies if I don't share your fond memories of it. This dinosaur-obsessed kid, Jason, gets a Christmas present in the mail, and boy, this one has some pacing issues. Wow! Look how big it is, Jason! I wonder who it's from! Good question, Jason. There's a full pause in between every line of dialogue. Even if it's meant to be an immediate reaction and it becomes extremely distracting. Jason tries to sneak downstairs and open his package early, but he gets caught. He has to watch his kid brother for a little while and whines about that like he whines about everything else. He distracts his brother with the TV and drags the big package into his room like he knows he's not supposed to, and opens it and yet again whines about not getting exactly what he wants. 
I hate this kid, and what kind of dinosaur obsessive would whine about getting a real dinosaur egg? It somehow rolls out of his room and falls all the way down the stairs and hatches into a pterosaur. And this kid immediately decides that he needs to try to fight it? This movie has barely started and I already have such a massive antipathy for the main character. His kid brother names the dinosaur Spot and unfortunately pterosaurs aren't domesticated and it immediately starts wrecking the house. His parents get so confused by Jason's willingness to be kind to his kid brother that they assume he's drugged or delirious, so I guess he's somehow even worse the rest of the time. The next morning, Spot grew to over double his original size. They hide him in their treehouse while they go to school, but Spot gets bored and follows them there and ends up scaring off Tommy's bully. Dinosaur fun montage! Spot continues to get bigger and the brothers notice that he's starting to seem depressed. They decide to help him try to find his family by taking him to the place where his egg is from, which is fortunately not far from their home. This flying sequence is probably the most interesting part of this movie, but isn't this in, like, Colorado? Why are there palm trees here? They fail to find his family on the first trip and return home. The next day is Christmas, and the boys admit to their family that they open the present early and introduce Spot to their extremely freaked out parents. Suddenly, dinosaurs start flooding the town to retrieve Spot, and miraculously nobody gets eaten about it. This brontosaurus gives Jason a big ol' smackaroo and they all leave. Maybe it's because I've never been a dinosaur kid, or a dinosaur adult for that matter, but this movie just completely failed to connect with me. It sounds weird, it looks weird, the Christmas aspect is so non-integral to the movie that I feel like it could have taken place any day of the year. This one's going on a low branch. Next, Ed, Ed, and Eddie's Fala la la Ed. Ed and Eddie are messing around in Double D's house. They eventually crash into his ancestral fruitcake, which gets Ed thinking about Christmas and Santa. It's currently the middle of July and a holiday called Piggy Bank Day where everyone breaks open their piggy banks. Eddie shows up to offer a scheme to get the money out of their piggy banks without breaking them. In reality, he just has Double D hidden in there to smash them open. Ed decides that it's Christmas anyways. Rolf decides it's Christmas as well and starts gifting everything he has, including the literal shirt off his back. Everyone else starts to agree that maybe it is Christmas after all. The group decides to go caroling for money, or rather, threaten to never stop caroling unless they're bribed to leave. They buy jawbreakers with their winnings, and Ed ends up giving them all away. The conceit of this one is really funny. The fact that it's the middle of summer and they all just start agreeing that it's Christmas as some kind of shared delusion initiated by Ed is definitely a more unique concept for a Christmas episode than most. However, the fact that it's quite literally not Christmas does damage this one's ranking on the feels like Christmas meter. Due to being funny and creative but not actually Christmas, this one goes in the middle of the tree. Why not go right into the second at an any Christmas special, Jingle Jingle Jangle. This one's a more proper Christmas special, but unfortunately the only version I could find is in potato quality. This episode opens on Eddie hunting for his Christmas presents, and he finds them hidden under the floorboards of the attic. He ends up just tearing all of them open, and all of them are lame. Meanwhile, the Canker Sisters are popping open some Christmas crackers and suddenly become the three magi when they see Eddie's flashlight reflected in the sky. Ed is trying to make his room as hospitable for Santa as possible. All the others end up in his room and argue about the meaning of Christmas. Eddie decides that the only way to salvage his Christmas is to get adopted. He tries Johnny's house first. His family has a tradition to fill their whole house with snow and ice, and once he catches on to Eddie's greedy plan, kicks him out in spectacular fashion. Next, he tries Rolf, convincing him with a fake sob story. Rolf takes him in, but Eddie is quickly put off by his atypical Christmas celebrations, which do not include gift-giving. Then he tries Naz, who he ends up spitting eggnog all over. He gets lured by a fake present into Double D's lesson about the true meaning of Christmas, and promptly beats him up about it. Eddie tries Jimmy's house next, and gets kicked out after single-handedly eating his entire gingerbread village. As a last-ditch effort, he goes to the house of Kevin, who gifts him a knuckle sandwich. Eddie gets baited into replacing a bulb on a Christmas tree, and Double D shoehorns in a lesson on the spirit of giving, which Eddie decides he finally understands. Santa drops his sack on him with presents for all the kids in town, and he immediately reconsiders his lesson and runs off with all the presents. Ed and Double D wrestle to get the presents back from him, and the Kanker sisters interrupt to bring them mold, franks and scents, and fur. And then they all get sexual harassment for Christmas. I never appreciated Ed, Ed and Eddie as a kid, but as an adult this series has grown on me. 
I used to see the show as overwhelmingly ugly and grating, but now I see it more as snappy stylization and a high-energy, absurdist writing style. And this episode is certainly no exception. This one gets a slightly higher ranking than the previous one due to a few key factors. First, it's actually set at Christmas rather than in the middle of the summer. It's double length, and of course, it's snow-filled and cheesy and full of those good old Christmas tropes. Next, totally spies evil Gladys much? A prison employee is distributing meals to the inmates and gets attacked. Cut to the spies doing some shopping, and the boots that Clover was ogling get bought out by Mandy and her mom. And worse, they get forced to attend Whoop's lame Christmas party as janitorial staff, and even worse, their AI system Gladys turns evil after Alex spills some punch on it. Here come the test results. You are a horrible person. That's what it says. A horrible person. We weren't even testing for that. She does a HAL 9000 shtick for a bit, and then ambushes them with an easily foiled ninja suit. Apparently she's evil because Jerry downloaded the brain of that mini Megamind fellow we saw before, and used it as a framework for the AI. How did you not consider that that would go poorly for you, Jerry? Jerry! They get a Christmas-themed version of their usual spy item sequence. They sneak through the facility to the villain prison, and figure out that Gladys has the same allergic reaction to cranberry that he has, cause you know how when you're allergic to something it makes you extra evil for a while? They agree to collaborate to take down Gladys, because that totally isn't going to backfire, and he says that he needs a base to counteract the acid that's making her act up. Fortunately, Alex has some pocket ammonia. The ammonia puts Gladys back to normal, and Clover abuses her power to confiscate someone's boots. Predictably, the brain betrays Jerry and Alex and goes to nuke the world using Whoop's missiles. Sam and Clover stop the missiles via some kind of mobile game, and Jerry catches the brain with a butterfly net. Gladys thwarts the rest of the missiles by making them run into each other, and we get a gloriously festive space explosion. Back home, Mandy's boots got sold off to impress some celebrity, and Clover gives her the confiscated boots as a show of goodwill. But only because she got some even trendier boots for Christmas. Fighting ensues. This one just felt so remarkably not Christmassy to me. As a general rule, if Christmas in a Christmas special could be swapped out for an any time of the year birthday, it's not remarkably functional as a Christmas episode. Don't get me wrong, this was a perfectly fine episode of Totally Spies, but it doesn't feel like Christmas, and it doesn't feel particularly special either. Low tree placement for this one. Next, Billy and Mandy save Christmas. These show creators love doing naughty and nice lists with the staff's names. Our main characters are in line to see Santa, which Billy assumes is the line for the bathroom. Mandy complains about Santa being a capitalist scam, and Grim insists that they went to college together. Billy skips to the front of the line and gives his ludicrously long Christmas list to this familiar-looking mall Santa, while also pissing on his lap, and oops, everyone finds out that he's not really Santa, and a riot ensues. How come every time I take you kids to the mall, it burns to the ground? Grimm cuts a hole in the fabric of reality to warp to the North Pole and convince Mandy that Santa is real. They show up at his workshop, and the place is eerily empty. Mrs. Claus takes them down to the basement, where Santa is being kept in a gingerbread coffin. He's been vampirized and tries to kill them, but quickly gives up. Oh, he always did tire out quickly. Some casual sexual performance humor for your Christmas episode. Mandy insists that they need to find and kill the vampire who turned him, and then he should go back to normal. Mandy and Grimm depart to go do some vampire hunting, and Billy stays behind with Mrs. Claus. The first pair crashes into the home of the head vampire, and he's mostly just annoyed that they broke his window and stained his linens. Mandy immediately stakes him, but he comes back. He says that there's a vampire above him in the hierarchy who's their actual target, and asks to come with because he's always wanted to save Christmas. And Grimm has always wanted to save Christmas with a vampire sidekick, and so it all works out. They go to ask Santa what he saw before he was turned, and Mrs. Claus traps them in the basement with a freed vampire Santa, and Baron Von Gulish suddenly remembers that Mrs. Claus is the real head vampire. After escaping with the power of song, they confront her. Billy breaks a conveniently placed in case of vampire attack panel, and receives instructions from a holographic Santa while Graham and Mandy escape a swarm of vampire elves. As Mandy is about to stake Mrs. Claus with this non-branded blonde fashion doll, Billy delivers a bowl of vampire antidote to Santa and turns him back to normal. They talk some sense into Mrs. Claus, and afterwards Mandy asks if he's concerned if this will happen again, and it turns out that this has happened six or seven times before. Hence, the conveniently placed vampire panel. They hold hands and sing as Spurg is attacked by vampire elves. Billy reveals that he actually celebrates Hanukkah. 
I really enjoyed this one. There's a lot of ways that Billy and Mandy isn't exactly conducive to a Christmas special, but they did a really good job of balancing their signature dark and supernatural themed comedy with the holiday stylings. As is typical of this show, it was clever, it looked good, and the voice cast knocked it out of the park, including the amusing casting choice of Gilbert Gottfried as Santa. I'll swallow your soul! Also, the whole concept of Santa having a vampire wife who uses him to try to vampirify the whole world sometimes, but he just forgives her every time is just ridiculously funny. This one goes near the top of the tree. Next, Kids Next Door Operation Naughty. A group who appears to be the candy break into Santa's workshop and knock out all the elves and Santa with sleeping gas. We regroup with them and they seem to have no idea of what just transpired. Arriving back at their treehouse base, they find that it's been cut down. A strike force from the North Pole appears and gives them a beatdown, accusing them of stealing the reindeer. Number three gives everyone a can of whoop ass in return because she thinks they're after the present she got for number four. This works out until the head elf calls the 12 days of Christmas attack upon her and opens the present to find an exclusive Christmas Eve only rainbow monkey, giving them a solid alibi for the attack that just transpired. Cut to a spacious room where the delightful children from down the lane, shedding their KND disguise, are holding Santa captive. We are good children! Better than every other snot kid in the world! And this year, we're going to prove it by getting all the presents! We're Well, that sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? They change the naughty and nice list so that everyone in the world gets coal except for them, and conveniently the presents don't actually have to be delivered by hand, they just automatically turn into coal while the delightful children's tree fills up with them. There's a bunch more superhero-themed action sequences, and the K&D busts into the dome to foil the delightful children and... Oh my god! Oh my god, why, why did that happen? No, seriously, why did that happen? Did I miss something? Okay, earlier Santa said something about how this would corrupt their minds, and I guess that's what this looks like. Number three walks in, scorned by the fact that nobody got her any Christmas presents, and also gets corrupted by the power to change the naughty and nice lists. Santa rips the door open and makes number four go in there to give her a present to revert her back to normal. The Christmas X-Men turn their cut-down treehouse into the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. I need to be honest with you. I don't like this show. I don't think it's nice to look at, the writing and humor just doesn't jive with me. I'm not saying it's unforgivably bad or anything, I just don't care for it. This particular episode focused a lot more on the superhero parody angle than its festiveness, and probably because I'm an already non-superhero interested person who's also deeply superhero fatigued, but I just thought that this didn't add much to the episode at all. The part where messing with Santa's list is this horrifying, corrupting force was pretty interesting, but that's about it for me. This one gets a lower middle placement. Next, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, A Lost Clause. <sighs> oh my god, this show looks so good. It's so insanely stylish. Everyone is decorating the home for Christmas, and it's Mac and Blue's first year that they'll be celebrating with them. Blue becomes distraught when he learns that he'll only be getting one present for Christmas, even though he thought he would be getting eight. No, I said I get eight. But Santa himself comes in to save the day, promising plenty of gifts. A second Santa appears and starts a fight about which one is the real one, and then dozens more follow. This sends Mac into a complete existential crisis, because if all these Santas are fake, what if they all are? And then Mac has a festive mental breakdown. Blue slaps some sense into him and justifies the myth of Santa Claus with some justifiable explanations using the show universe's rules, and several other very misled attempts. Coco's working as the mall Santa, and everybody buys it until her beard gets ripped off. Blue's up late agonizing over his singular present and decides to give Harriman the old Ebenezer Scrooge treatment. Except he mistakes Jacob Marley for Bob Marley, and the ghost of Christmas present as the ghost of Christmas present? Harriman buys this anyways, but since he says one present isn't right, and two presents isn't right, he interprets this to mean zero presents. Harriman disposes of all the Christmas decorations, leaving Foster's home barren. Mac bargains with Santa to himself in a scene that's remarkably similar to somebody having a religious crisis of faith. The next day on Christmas morning, he looks for the specific present he asked for, and it never shows up. His mom is baffled because he's upset about not getting underwear for Christmas. Miraculously, Christmas decorations are restored and all of the residents of Foster's home have their own presents. Mac's stocking is filled too, with the tidy whitey underwear that he prayed for. Blue gets coal. Mac is affirmed with his faith in God, I mean Santa, again, and the episode ends. 
Kind of like I have an unfair bias against the previous episode because it was from a show I dislike, I have an unfair bias in favor of this episode because this is a show I just love so, so goddamn much. It's so cute, it's so funny, the characters are so lovable, and this episode is no exception. And the setup of Mac seeing a shit ton of imaginary Santas and being sent into an existential crisis over it is so funny that I had to pause to stop laughing or else I'd start missing things. Mac's doubt in Santa being framed as this quasi-religious just crisis of faith is also an interesting framing device. It's not often that you can do a full-blown Christian reading of one of these specials unless it specifically involves the birth of Christ. I really like this episode, so it's going at a high point on the tree. Next, Robot Boy's Christmas Evil. There's a couple slightly lesser known shows in the latter half of 2005, so let me give you a bit of background. This French Astro Boy derivative has the titular robot boy being kept by human child Tommy Turnbull to stay close to the villain Dr. Kamikaze as he plots to take over the world. And so, each episode they foil a different evil plot, there are some human friends, you get the picture. This episode opens on Dr. Kamikaze doing an experiment on his henchman Constantine. To be honest, seeing this after not thinking about the show for over a decade, it was a little jarring to be immediately subjected to this. Cut to Robot Boy and his friends watching Christmas specials. Tommy's stereotypical bully older brother changes the channel and for some reason he's trying to get double cheeked up. Kamikaze and Constantine show up on the concert show he changed it to and just fully announce their evil plans in song form. At the North Pole, Santa catches on that he's been scammed and halts the delivery of presents to Kamikaze's fraudulent charity and gets ambushed by the villains. Tommy and Robot Boy sneak into Santa's workshop and also get ambushed, turning Robot Boy back into his toy form. Santa escapes his binding and turns into Rambo and enacts a beatdown on the villain's monsters. I don't know if this is just the file I found, but the audio mixing just gets terrible at times. Sorry, but I got about a hundred million chimneys to slide down! Tommy breaks into their evil lair and replaces Robot Boy's batteries. Almost, buddy. But we've got a couple of things to wrap up before we celebrate. See what I mean? You could barely even hear him. Robot Boy goes into a super-powered form and finishes the beatdown. They all open Christmas presents. The end. This one was pretty rough. It was pretty sparing with the Christmas cheer, felt disjointed and hard to follow at times. Like, what is this guy doing with his ass? Why does it never come up again? I was assuming that this was some kind of Chekhov's ass situation, but you know what they say when you assume. That audio problem was just so distracting, and I'm a bit hung up on the fact that the antagonist characters have designs that are... racist? Low branch for this one. Next, Atomic Betty's Noel 9. Another slightly lesser known Cartoon Network title, this one follows a girl who's a normal student by day and a crime-fighting space girl by night. Santa's flight is interrupted by this petty villain who gives the reindeer some food as a distraction to steal his sack of presents, which actually contain Atomic Betty and her two sidekicks. The visuals in the show are constantly conflicting between the cute, extremely stylish character designs and the weird, stilted flash tweening movements. I'm constantly switching back and forth between thinking the show looks great and thinking it looks weird. After a strange little Christmas Carol moment, we cut to the two main antagonists, Maximus and Minimus, discussing their plans to ruin Christmas. Back at home, Betty is chatting with her grandma, a retired galactic guardian, about the time that she lost her husband in a space battle. She believes he's still out there and will eventually see her lava lamp beacon and return to her. Meanwhile, Maximus and Minimus are stealing entire planets to use as Christmas tree decorations, and Betty's neighborhood is having a light pollution off. Betty gets summoned to work by her fish boss, who is currently swimming in babes. She gets on a video call with Eminem and learns about their evil shrinky plan. After a chase, the villains get sidetracked by the sound of singing, and Betty learns about the Noel Nine, a group of singing planets which for the purposes of this episode are coveted by the villains. They stop at Sparky's house to pick him up. And okay, another thing impacting my judgment of quality for this is if the episode is so rapid fire that I start missing plot points just by writing down notes, it gets dinged on pacing a bit. And at this point in the episode, I have already had to rewind three times. Santa comes, some robots attack, I don't know how we got here. They leave with Sparky and his mom. They go to pick up the other sidekick, X5, on his metal trash planet and have a robot dinosaur beat down. X5's uncle comes with him too, and with him, Sparky's mom, and the three fish babes, it's starting to get awfully crowded in there. Maximus and Minimus have an extremely unequitable present exchange, and we get another obligatory Christmas musical sequence. I am generally of the opinion that you either commit to having a musical episode or just cut the musical sequences entirely. Otherwise, they almost always seem weird and shoehorned in, and this is no exception. 
They arrive at the Noel 9 to find them silent and dormant. Betty and Sparky go down to the planet to get answers and find an old man who identifies himself as a galactic guardian. And Betty doesn't identify who he is, despite it being pretty obvious. Since the planets begin singing again, the villains find them and begin stealing them. Betty comes up with a plot to trade herself for the planets. They realize that the villains aren't going to follow through on their end of the trade deal, so they plan to attack the ship and release the planets in the chaos. Everyone invades the ship and work together to take down Eminem and their minions, but end up in a trap. They realize that they can communicate with the shrunken Noel 9 with Song, and escape with their assistance and all the planets are restored to their original size. Betty realizes that the old man is her grandpa, and they return to Earth and everyone reunites. The power goes off across the entire world, and the Noel 9 show up to make things merry anyways. And I guess her grandpa is William Shatner. So this was a double length episode, which I've stated usually qualifies as a plus, but this didn't really feel like a double length episode worthy plot. It just felt like an excuse to have a lot of very long, very hollow feeling action sequences, and the one heartfelt plot about Betty reuniting with her long lost family felt sidelined and insignificant. I understand that it's hard to have a very Christmassy setting when your plots are set in space, but the vast majority of the special felt like a very normal, any time of the year Atomic Betty special. And also kind of like Robot Boy, we've got another slightly racist antagonist design. Like don't get me wrong, the Dr. Kamikaze duo is way worse with their yellow skin and broken English, but Maximus's character design is orientalist tropes from toe to tip. From his facial hair, to his robe, to the fact that he's a Siamese cat furry. So I didn't think this one was great, but it's not at the bottom of the pile either, due to feeling pretty high effort. Next, The Legend of Frosty the Snowman. Now this is not the Frosty the Snowman you may be thinking of. The original was made in 1969, but this one is from 2005. And I'm really, really trying not to go into this one with too much negativity. It could be fine, it could be good even, but it's not going to be, is it? The narration states that this boy, Tommy Tinkerton, needs Frosty's help. His dad is the mayor, and um, I'm sensing some corruption here. He goes around making sure that the town is in pristine condition before eventually doing the same to his family, who seem a bit miserable due to his authoritarianism. The town of Evergreen is a bit fascist coded, it's actually a bit creepy at times. The whole beginning of this movie is just various scenes of this town being obsessed with tradition and order, and just generally being very surreal in a Stepford Wives kind of way. I don't know how I feel about the visuals in this movie. It's clearly trying to harken back to a more mid-century style like the original Frosty the Snowman, but it doesn't really commit to that enough to not have flash jank written all over it. And I, of all people, am not against flash jank! But it's hard to not compare this to the original Cell animated special, which is just so much more polished and stylish. Frosty the Snowman's hat has been following and seemingly taunting the local children until it full-on abducts this kid named Walter. He crashes into the snow and puts the hat on the snowman-shaped mound he just created, and this Frosty is just so, so clearly voiced by the same person as Patrick Starr. A snowman? I am? You're right, I am! He's nearly using the same voice, just like one to the left. They play in the snow for a while and Walter comes home late, upsetting his mother. The next day at school, Walter has been given a swag injection, and the school's faculty clamps down on that by giving him a dunce cap. Meanwhile, Frosty is causing Tommy to hallucinate. The mayor tries to get Walter to fess up about what he was out doing last night and seems to recall something after he claims to have been out playing with a magical snowman. Walter's outing inspires two other kids, Tommy and his crush Sarah, to go out and play in the snow except Tommy is acting like a total stalker about it. He follows Frosty's hat to the local library, and it distracts Walter and Tommy's brother Charlie, leading them both to play outside, and Tommy to find a comic that just retcons the entire first special. Instead of the magician being this random guy who's scorned by the kids not paying attention to him, he's this kid's dad? Not much of a family resemblance. However, the comic goes blank before the story ends. Since Charlie been brain poisoned by Frosty, Tommy gets appointed to be his dad's new favorite child and his officially designated narc. Frosty encounters Sarah next. Maybe you're talking too loudly. Maybe you're maybe may, may, may. And after talking about how she doesn't like the way her mother won't let her be her own person, he makes an ice skating rink in her backyard and a pair of magical ice skates. The kids who've encountered Frosty so far have made a secret resistance. 
And as Tommy's mom is going through some old photos, he recognizes that the comic actually depicts his father and grandpa. Yep, that evil magician from the first one? That's his grandfather. Frosty's influence is starting to spread across town, and the townsfolk are starting to disobey the draconian rules. And the mayor is having a mental crisis because he knows deep down that Frosty is real, and the evil principal is seeding doubt in his ability to lead. The adults rant angrily about Frosty's effect on the children at a town hall meeting, and the evil principal completes his power grab. Tommy wishes that the rest of the comic's pages weren't blank, which is enough to cause the rest of them to fill in. Turns out that the evil principal also knows of Frosty's existence, and locked away his hat in the distant past to prevent Frosty from ever coming back. It also foretells Frosty's imminent doom, where he falls into a less-than-frozen pond, and everyone blames Tommy because he's the ex-mayor's official narc and the only kid who wasn't friends with Frosty. There's this little gag here with the principal. Before the clipboards, <laughs> forget about it. I needed ten hours, but now I get by on next to nothing. And this made me so confused at first, because it's, it's framed as a covert adult joke, right? The total lack of context and the non-specificity? But no, he's talking about sleep. The kids sneak into the school and steal Frosty's hat and act like they're going to kill this man. They bring Frosty back to life, and the parents find them all dancing together, revealing that they weren't lying all along. Tommy's dad realizes that Frosty wasn't a figure of his imagination after all. Frosty teaches the adults of the town the benefits of being whimsical, and the town of Evergreen is freed from the grips of fascism once again. So this feels like they were trying to have their cake and eat it too. They wanted to make a sequel to the first special, but they also wanted to have their own original story that doesn't relate to the first, with disastrous results. The final product is something that's too much of a bastardization of the original story to appeal to its fans, and too nonsensical to appeal to an audience that isn't familiar with it. I'm stuck between wanting to try avoiding comparison between these two specials, and feeling like the sequel actively invites comparison, which it does to its extreme disadvantage. But even on its own merit, this one just doesn't resonate with me. It's strange, it's disjointed, it falls flat when it's trying to be funny, the main conflict reads as trite and emotionally dishonest. I kind of wish that they'd really committed to this whole fascism allegory concept, because that sounds kind of interesting, but they just did so little with this setup. It just felt like, hey, remember this guy from this old Christmas special that everybody likes better? We've got this guy! I'm not knocking the casting choice of Bill Fagerbakke as Frosty the Snowman, because he does have a good voice for this kind of character. However, I do wish he'd done a bit more to distinguish this voice role from his much more famous one. Tom Kenny, voice of Spongebob, is in this one too as the mayor, but he's in practically everything, including like half the specials I've covered already. Ultimately, this one's getting a pretty low placement on the tree, as it did not particularly exceed my negative expectations. Next, Looney Tunes' Ba Humduck. Bugs Bunny pops out of the ground to wish the audience a Merry Christmas, and nearly gets run over by this gigantic SUV carrying a Scrooge-like tycoon Daffy Duck. He refuses to donate money to the less fortunate several times, and even steals a bucket of cashment to go to charity, but through a series of slapstick happenings, it returns to the original owner. The Looney Tunes characters are working at the mall he owns in various capacities and all doing their usual thing. Wacky hijinks, wacky hijinks, wacky hijinks. Bugs Bunny messes with him to get back at him for the near vehicular homicide that happened a moment ago. Wacky hijinks. Daffy Duck gets visited by this story's Jacob Marley, represented by Sylvester the Cat, and you get it, it's a Christmas carol. Daffy keeps on enacting his capitalist hellscape on all of his employees, denying all the requests for time off, and it gets a little too real at times. Daffy gets locked in the mall, and the first ghost, represented by Granny and Twee, apparates in his vault of cash and drags Daffy to witness his unhappy orphanage upbringing, where everyone gets adopted except for him. Daffy proposes that they use their time-bending powers to win big at the racetrack, and gets booted back to the present. Yosemite Sam, as Christmas present, takes him to witness the suffering of his employees. Bless swaggy hijinks! And finally, he meets Christmas Future, as represented by the Tasmanian Devil, and confronts his imminent lonely death, as well as the collapse of his business empire. Porky's daughter still shows him some kindness after all that he's done, and he has a change of heart. He gives all of his employees generous Christmas gifts and gives them the day off. This scene makes something clear that I had overlooked for most of this movie, and that is the fact that Granny, Tweety, Sylvester, Yosemite Sam, and Taz are all dead. <laughs> They're ghosts. They died. They are straight up resting in peace as we speak. Merry Christmas, everybody. Tweety Bird is fucking dead. They all have a Christmas party. Wacky hijinks. The end. 
I don't have a lot of affection for post-millennium Looney Tunes, mostly because it relies so heavily on the goofy slapstick antics, and not so much on clever dialogue and character interactions. However, the animation is really slick and smooth, so it's consistently nice to look at, and the soundtrack was also remarkably well-crafted. This one goes firmly in the middle. Next, Ben 10's Merry Christmas. We open on a very non christmasy scene in the middle of scorching hot Death Valley, and... Forgive me, I don't remember the names of any of his transformations. But he turns into the little frog guy to power up the air conditioner, and ends up breaking it instead. Taking notice of an unexpected holiday display, they suddenly stumble into a winter wonderland. They decide to accept this unexpected turn of events and have some Christmas fun. They all split up and their grandpa Max gets dragged off by some elves and turned into Santa. They claim that Santa has gone missing, and so this sinister elf decides to use Max as a convenient replacement. Gwen and Ben get attacked by an army of nutcrackers, and this well-meaning elf yells at them to get out of there. Ben changes to a speedy form and they run off. The elf catches up to them again and warns them that if they don't get out of there, they'll be affected by the curse of the village. Suddenly, their faces change to resemble the elves, but they can't leave without their grandpa. They go looking for him, falling deep into the toy-making workshop. They're tasked with destroying the machine responsible for the curse, and after a bit of action shenanigans, they arrive and wreck it in a similar way to how we wrecked the air conditioner earlier. Frogger moment. They talk some sense into the elf that's created this artificial winter wonderland, and deliver the presents that they made with Ben's flying form. The curse is broken for good. Merry Summer Miss. This one was pretty fun, had an unusual and interesting concept, and thoroughly felt like Christmas despite being set in the middle of summer. I always support the use of an alternate reality winter wonderland for these specials. It's a quick and easy way to make things feel Christmassy if your setting isn't very conducive to winter aesthetics. I forgot how fun this show is to watch. It's fun, it's clever, it's fast-paced without feeling overwhelming or like you'll start missing things if you look down for two seconds. And it made one solid Christmas episode. High placement, although not quite as high as the equally good episodes that got a double-length special. Next, My Gym Partner's a Monkey, Have Yourself a Joyful Little Animus. I was truly not expecting this show to have a Christmas special. Well, I guess it kind of doesn't, because they're celebrating Animus, the animal version of Christmas, which lasts four and a half days, and Adam is completely baffled by the traditions, which mostly rely on animal instincts. This holiday is celebrated in, um, Jubilary, which seems to be a summer month. Animus has a few things in common with Christmas, like gift-giving and the complaint that it's been overrun with consumerism. When Adam goes to school the next day, none of the animal kids show up because it's tradition on the second day to go south. He can't instinctively find his way to the traditional Animus rock. And so by tradition, if every student doesn't find their way there, the Animus feast is cancelled. So now everyone's super upset with Adam, and Adam considers transferring the human school. The other teachers try a Christmas carol shtick on Miss Gill to get her animus spirit back, but they get her past wrong and so she quickly calls their bluff. And then they do, uh, it's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown reference, which is the wrong holiday. Adam eats some wasabi, which clears out his stuffy nose, and all of a sudden his animal instincts are activated. And therefore, animus is saved. This special definitely didn't feel much like Christmas due to being an intentional subversion of Christmas, which means it doesn't fit very well into a Christmas special marathon. I also just don't think the show is very funny. Low ranking. Next, the Class of 3000 Christmas special. I have extremely high expectations for the obligatory Christmas musical numbers on this one, and if it disappoints me, I'm just going to start setting fires. School's out for winter break, and Sunny Bridges is out enjoying the holiday vibes, and the students are asking for presents from Santa and debating on the reality of Santa Claus. Tamika is a diehard Santa believer, while Cam is a skeptic. What is this? What is happening? Oh, we've transitioned in the musical segment. It's kind of fun, but also wasn't that good to listen to compared to some of the others on this show. So instead of lighting fires indiscriminately, I'll just light this candle. I love the random art styles they pull out for these segments. Lil D wins a race to get a gaming console, but everything is ruined in the commotion, including the console. Oh, hell yeah, this one has the ads in! Woohoo, licensed shovelware games! And a Guitar Hero clone that's actually meant to teach you how to play guitar? Wonder how well that one worked. Back to the show, the others point out that Lil D has been naughty all year, and there's no way that he'll get a replacement console from Santa. He goes to beg Sunny for one instead. The next day, the class is at Eddie's mansion, enjoying an extremely fancy Christmas party. To impress his crush, Eddie invites literal, actual Santa Claus. 
Sunny enters the party and seems to both recognize and have some kind of grudge against Santa. More delightful 2007 ads, including some pre-flow progressive and kids bop. This is off topic, but when I was a kid, I had this mix CD that included Soak Up the Sun by Sheryl Crow, and a friend of mine asked me if it was Kids Bop Volume 3, and I was so, so goddamn offended. <laughs> Santa shows the kids his sled, or rather, his fuel-efficient mini-sled for casual trips, and they get to take a ride on it. Lil D asks why him and Sonny have bad blood, and asks if there's anything he can do to get him on good terms again, of course, in exchange for being put on the nice list. Lil D bugs Sonny until he gives in and tells him why he hates Santa. It turns out it's because he asked for skates for a roller skating party and got ice skates due to his non-specificity. And he broke both his legs and lost the lead role that he was cast for in that night's elementary school Christmas play. Which, well, seems like his fault for deciding to wear them anyways. One of these ads describes Pirates of the Caribbean 3 as the final chapter in the series and... If only. They had eye dogs at Burger King and oh my god. I want one so bad, I want one so bad, oh my god, I want one so bad. Santa squashes his beef with Sonny by letting him be hell for a while, but Lil D still isn't on the nice list because he knew that he was acting with selfish motivations. Acting with misguided intentions yet again, Lil D overloads his sled with cookies, causing them to run out of fuel and crash somewhere in the Arctic. Eddie receives a call from an upset and unusually sexy Mrs. Claus, and the kids promise to track Santa down. Fortunately, Madison knows how to fly a plane. Sonny and Santa are hiding out in a cave, and the former accuses the latter of being a cookie addict. They get found by the kids, but Madison forgets to land the plane before jumping out, and so now they have no way to get to the North Pole. Santa uses his power to lend the kids some reindeer magic, and so they pull his sleigh the rest of the way home. Cam, flying through the air, still doesn't believe that he's actually Santa. They arrive back at the workshop to find everything in disarray. Remember this cup stacking thing? The ads made it seem like the most fun thing in the world, but unfortunately just buying these cups doesn't automatically grant you ludicrous speed. We get a second musical interstitial, this time with puppets. Although, Andre doesn't sing in either one of these, and they're always better when he does. They get everything fixed up and deliver all the presents, and everyone gets what they wanted for Christmas, including Lil D because he stepped up to save Christmas. Woohoo! Third Christmas song! I think we've hit the quota, we don't need any more fires. <laughs> I was looking forward to this one, and I feel like I was right too. It was very fun, very festive, and the character of Santa in this one as a normal guy who will show up when you invite him to a Christmas party was pretty humorous and unique for one of these specials. You usually get a flat, heavily tropey Santa, or an over-the-top ironic subversion, but no, Santa in this one is just kind of your cool uncle who happens to have superpowers. It was incredibly stylish, as Class of 3000 always is, and just overall a good time. Bonus points for double length, too. This one's got a high spot on the tree. God, I'm so fucking tired. Next, Camp Laszlo's Camp Kringle. The campers are being driven up to a mountaintop and go out to play in the snow after their bus blows its tires. They realize that the scenery has been meticulously decorated for Christmas, and suddenly some elves appear and lead them to Santa's workshop. This is another Tom Kenny talking to himself type show. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, we blew a tire. Tours are on every other Thursday, so you can uh, get lost now! Santa comes out and greets everyone and invites them inside. Turns out they're on this mountain because Santa moved his workshop due to global warming. He's trying to get all the presents finished early so he can go on vacation for the first time in several hundred years. Suddenly, an extremely inconvenient meteorite hits the workshop and ruins all of his progress. So that Christmas doesn't have to be cancelled this year, Laszlo invites Santa to Camp Kidney, with the promise that if he has the time of his life in the next week, he won't have to take a vacation. They start treating Santa to all their usual camp activities, including my typical experience of playing volleyball. Unfortunately, Santa doesn't really enjoy any of the activities that they have for him. Just as he's storming out, he whacks the tetherball, accidentally finding an activity that he really loves. Unfortunately, this backfires, and Santa announces that he's giving up on making toys for children to play tetherball full-time. Meanwhile, Scoutmaster Lumpus has taken up residence at Santa's workshop. The campers scheme to get Santa to hate Camp Kidney, but all of their plans fail. Laszlo pathetically tries to assemble some toys himself, and this makes Santa snap out of it and go back to his workshop. But Lumpus has fully claimed control over the place, and so they battle. It seems like Santa's in a bad place until an extremely convenient meteorite lands on Lumpus and Christmas is saved. This was another not actually set on Christmas Christmas episode, but I thought it was pretty fun and festive regardless. 
These specials tend to get pretty tropey and derivative, so a plot like Santa Gets Addicted to Tetherball was a refreshing change, especially in comparison to like all the repetitive Christmas Carol parodies. And as far as Camp Laszlo goes, which can be pretty hit or miss in my opinion, this was a good episode. Upper middle tree placement for this one. Next, Chowder's Hey Hey It's Knishmas. We open this episode with a cute little stop motion sequence of Gazpacho explaining the holiday of Knishmas, which is basically just Christmas but everything has a slightly different name. And whether or not you get presents hinges on whether you make a good enough schmingerbread house. Mung and Schnitzel go out to buy a Knishmas tree, which is just this guy selling off his cousins. Chowder is admiring a fancy cooking tool and assumes that Knish Crinkle will bring it to him. Chowder gets in line to tell Knish Crinkle what he wants for Knishmas, although it's just gazpacho in costume. Schnitzel cuts him in line. Gazpacho Pinky promises that he'll get what he asked for, which leaves Mung in a panic because he messes up his schmingerbread house every year. They try assembling the house 50 times, and each time it falls to pieces. Truffle suggests getting one store-bought, and at first he's too proud to consider it, but the thought of disappointing Chowder makes him go through the humiliating ordeal of buying one from his rival. Chowder catches him in the act and vows to fix the situation. He goes to ask Gazpacho Crinkle to save Monk's happiness as a Knishmas gift, and he then has a crisis over living a lie, tears off the costume, and runs away. The kids take the Crinkle costume and disguise themselves so they can make it seem like Crinkle chose the one that he made instead. The real Knish Crinkle comes down the chimney in the meantime, and they battle, and Chowder eats the house before he can. Crinkle notices Chowder's selflessness in trying to make Mung happy, and gifts him the trimmer. This one was a solid example of balancing a show's typical writing style with cheesy Christmas special tropes. The show never sacrifices its relentless bizarreness, but it feels merry and festive all the same. It had some pretty funny gags, but it was mostly just good in a pretty unremarkable way. I don't really have anything to rave about, but I don't have anything to complain about either. This one gets an upper middle placement. Next, 16's Deck the Mall. The mall is predictably hectic with activity. Caitlin is struggling to set up a secret Santa, and Jen is extremely frustrated with her retail job, and is also dealing with the double whammy of being one year from her parents' separation, and the fact that her mom and Jonesy's dad have started dating, and their families are going to be celebrating Christmas together this year. Jonesy, meanwhile, is taking a job as a mall elf, and promptly gets fired while trying to flirt with a MILF. They all decide to celebrate together by sneaking into a movie, but they can't decide which one to pick. They make too much noise, get kicked out, and end up getting lost on their way out. Since it's Christmas Eve, the mall has closed early, and they get locked in. That, and it seems like their secret Santa presents have been stolen. They argue, make up, and realize that Jonesy has a master key left over from his security job, and they engage in some revelry. They find their secret Santa presents in a charity donation box and decide to leave them there. This one really did not feel like a Christmas special in the slightest. This felt like an extremely regular episode of 16, and like, it's a funny show, I laughed a few times, but this is a Christmas specials ranking, not a normal-ass cartoon episode ranking. Low branch. Just to let you know how I'm doing, I started this recording at midnight, and it is currently 6 a.m. Next up, The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack's Low Tidings. This one opens up with a special stop motion, or at least stop motion styled, holiday intro, which gets it some bonus points right off the bat. As the title indicates, this world celebrates Low Tides Day instead of Christmas. Bubby has to get out of there because there won't be enough water to swim in, and Knuckles doesn't observe for reasons he refuses to elaborate on. Flapjack threatens a musical sequence that he doesn't follow through on, and Bubby spits out Knuckles and forces him to endure the holiday with Flapjack. Knuckles runs through the town in a panic to find his hiding spot, and he recounts the event that made him resent Low Tide's day. He didn't get a present in his boot, and also, I hide from the six to eight merman who stuffed me in a sack! Why are you doing this?! because that's the consequence of being naughty in this universe. All of the other hidey holes in town are filled with naughty folks trying to hide from the mermen, and Knuckles decides to kill himself. But he changes his mind when Flapjack offers to teach him how to be good. Knuckles' redemption does not go smoothly. You have a lot of nerve coming in here. You have a lot of nerve being alive. And there's a second fake-out musical number, but Flapjack finds an opportunity to be benevolent by filling in for sick actors in a pageant. But this ends up just re-traumatizing Knuckles, and he ends up having a freak out on the crowd. He blacked out and still thinks he's in the clear to get a gift. Peppermint Larry invents the concept of Santa, and Flapjack asks for Knuckles to be redeemed this year. Alas, he does not get his wish, and here come the mermen to beat his ass again. 
Flapjack assumes that his gift must have fallen out of the hole in his boot, and they plummet to the sea floor to go look for it. Flapjack has a third aborted musical sequence, and Knuckles finally has an opportunity to do good by splashing water on a stranded bubby. Poseidon appears and insists that sacks only be used for carrying presents from then on. From now on, your main present shall come from a giant sack, uh, delivered by that guy. <gasps> Hold on, is that J.K. Simmons? Oh my god, it is! It's not his body, but it is his voice. I'm kind of on the fence about the Christmas spiritishness of this particular special. It's definitely more on the side of sticking to its typical style than it is on the side of being merry and bright. I can't knock it for being true to itself, but it also kind of sticks out among the lineup of Christmas specials. This was a pretty amusing one, and the six to eight mermen thing was a solid running gag. And so I think this one ends up with an upper middle placement. My bangs are reflecting my exhaustion. Next, the Garfield shows caroling capers. John's putting up Christmas decorations and Garfield's complaining about being hungry. He realizes from a Christmas special that he can collect Christmas cookies if he goes caroling and sets off around the neighborhood much to everyone's scorn. Oh, these character animations are just so, so horrifying. Nermal shows up and insists that he can do a better job and beats his ass handily and gets an entire Christmas meal out of it. Stop that! My singing is not that bad. And it literally isn't. The quality of their singing is nearly the same, and I feel like I'm being gaslit. He tries again with some mice as accompaniment, which predictably freaks people out instead of charming them. As a last-ditch effort, he assembles a drum set out of trash and finally gets to join in on Nermal and Odie's successful caroling. Since we've got double Garfields, I'll wait to give my ranking to compare the first special with the second. Next is the Garfield Show's Home for the Holidays. Just like last time, John is decorating and Garfield is watching the TV. John has to brush out and go grocery shopping and insist that Garfield and Odie finish decorating the tree. Garfield manages to put up the ornaments in a single successful fling and they all go together to the grocery store. Arlene shows up and is an abomination of a character design as usual. You know that scene in Monsters, Inc. where the guy gets hit with the scream extractor? Yeah, yeah, that one. That's how I feel about Arlene. She's collecting donations for a charity and rebuffs Garfield when he asks her to ditch that to come to dinner with them. Garfield has a change of heart and comes in with a big donation and reveals himself as the kind of person who would donate expired food to homeless people. We took stuff from the back of the refrigerator. That food hasn't seen the light of day for years. Arlene proposes that they find homes for all the strays, and they build a trashmas tree as a beacon to attract humans there. In part two of the episode, John and Liz's family have arrived for Christmas dinner. Garfield and Odie are still missing, so he's trying to stall for time to let them show up. Back with the homeless animals, they've completed their trashmas tree, and in an unexpected turn of events, decide to steal John's Christmas tree and their entire Christmas meal. John's family follows the beacon of light and finds their new setup, and the animals charm them and get adopted off by the various members of the family, and then other townspeople flood in and adopt everyone else. Despite the fact that I had to look at Arlene for so much of the second one, I think that the second special handily beats the first. It's a two-parter, so it feels like more of an event than the quick-feeling first one. It's more sentimental, it doesn't feel like they're lying to my face about what's happening on screen. And don't get me wrong, I really really do not like this show, and I especially do not like looking at this show. And I can't pretend that this doesn't affect my opinion of these specials compared to the rest on this list. All that said, I think Carolyn Capers gets a lower placement, and Home for the Holidays gets a middle placement. Next, Mad's Da Grinchy Code. If you're not familiar with the Mad animated TV show, it's a bunch of short little skits that are usually pop culture based, so I'm not going to be able to give a plot recap quite the same way that I have previously, because several of these skits would take the exact same amount of time to describe as it would to just watch the whole thing in real time. There's a Grinch and Da Vinci Code parody where Nick Cage, Tom Hanks, and Harrison Ford is Indiana Jones for some reason, solve the mystery of the Grinch who stole Christmas, except it was a misdirection and they were the ones who actually stole the presents. It's an ad for a lunchbox with a portal to Narnia, a list of rejected superheroes, a courtroom reality show where the judge is a mantis, a parody of a sitcom called Chuck that just went completely over my head. Most of these just aren't Christmas themed or just vaguely so. I liked this show and still kind of do, but this just doesn't even count as a Christmas special. Bottom branch. 
Next, Adventure Time Holly Jolly Secrets. Finn and Jake are out hunting for treasure and find a suitcase full of VHS tapes, which Finn recalls was buried by the Ice King, and so they go back to their place and play them back. It seems to just be the Ice King's video diary, which they find pretty boring but decide to watch anyways. It's mostly just the Ice King goofing around, but since they were promised evil secrets, they keep watching anyways. They start suspecting that the tapes contain some kind of coded message and call up Princess Bubblegum for help decoding them. But their call gets intercepted by the Ice King, who wants to see the evil secrets too, not realizing they're his own tapes. Part 2 of this episode contains some pretty major spoilers for Adventure Time, so please skip to the time code shown on screen if you'd like to avoid that. There's a pretty funny visual gag here about the strange tone of this episode. <laughs> Ice King plans to storm the treehouse and take his tapes back, and summons an army of snowmen, who proceed to beat him up. He eventually breaks in, but Finn and Jake are hiding under the bed, still watching and waiting for the evil secrets to show up. They get discovered and dismantle the snowman army, and Bimo plays the final tape, showing the researcher Simon Petrikov, the Ice King's former identity, progressively getting corrupted by the influence of the crown. He physically transforms and loses his mind, begging for forgiveness if this change ends up making him hurt people. The present-day Ice King is so far gone that he doesn't recognize the gravity of what's being shown on screen, and is just embarrassed about the fact that he used to wear glasses. The pair give the tapes back to the Ice King, and although this universe doesn't have Christmas, they decide to invite him and all their friends to sit around the fire and watch movies together to commemorate, quote, when Finn and Jake had a fleeting moment of empathy for the biggest weirdo in the land of Ooh. I hope you're all in the Christmas spirit, because I know I'm gonna get crucified for this one. I do not enjoy Adventure Time. It's not that I think the show is bad, it's just that its style of humor does not click with me. But despite this, I can acknowledge that this is a really strong episode and a major bomb drop moment, so this one gets some automatic bonus points for being an extremely pivotal moment in the plot of the series. But with that said, there was a lot of slow, meandering awkwardness to get through before that big reveal, and as far as the Christmas spirit goes, there's not much of it. I'm pretty conflicted about the ranking of this one, but I think due to the fact that it's our only special thus far that has a huge, far-reaching impact on the series as a whole, it gets a middle placement. <sighs> we had to get here eventually. Next is Johnny Tests A Holly Johnny Christmas. The main characters are witnessing a tree lighting with the whole town, and Johnny enthuses about his wish list. Obligatory holiday musical number. The top of his list is some kind of semi-automatic snowball gun, and it's at risk of selling out. His parents rush to go get one, but they're too late. It's up in the air whether Johnny's been good enough to get any presents from Santa, but his sisters step in and gift him a fully automatic snowball gun which proceeds to destroy the entire neighborhood. They then hack the company shipment to direct it to their city, and the other townsfolk catch wind of this and swarm the store before his family can get there. Giving up on the snowball gun, he donates his Christmas money to charity, which bumps him up to the nice list and so he gets his snowball machine after all. I don't think it's a particularly controversial opinion to say that Johnny Test is a grating show with an overly quick pace and an overly annoying sound design, but as far as things go, this episode was alright. If it was any other show, it would probably get more of a smack in the middle ranking, but because it's Johnny Test, I can't bear to give it more than lower middle. Next, The Amazing World of Gumball with an episode simply titled Christmas. The Watersons are driving through the neighborhood having a jolly good time when they run their car into a man that the kids believe to be Santa, although everyone else thinks he's just a homeless guy. The kids successfully beg their parents to take him in. They try to help him regain his memories by engaging in various Santa-like activities. Their mom reveals to them that Santa isn't real, and they all disappear before she can finish her story. Obligatory musical number about how Christmas is cancelled. Their dad discovers Santa's sleigh and causes it to rampage around the neighborhood, dropping a present on the guy's head and causing him to revert back into Santa Claus. Gumball gets picked up by the rampaging sleigh, and Santa instructs them on how to regain control of it. Anais and Darwin construct a makeshift runway, and the sleigh is landed successfully. They get some thank you gifts, and Santa flies off into the night. I haven't seen all that much of Gumball, but what I have seen I really enjoy. If Johnny Test does fast-paced humor in a way that I find 
deeply misguided, Gumball does it in a way that feels clever and rewarding. Although this was just a quick little 11 minute episode, it was full of Christmas cheer and man, this show looks so damn good. It's such a gorgeous example of mixed media animation and the way they play around with light, color, and point of view of the camera is so vivid and engaging. A couple points lost for not having all that much to engage with, but Gumball's getting a medium high spot on the tree. Next up is, um, the High Fructose Adventures of Annoying Orange, Orange Carol. Remember when the Annoying Orange had a Cartoon Network TV show starring Tabuscus? I didn't either. Let's get into it. Before I begin, can I just tell you how goddamn hard it was to find this episode? It hits just in that sweet spot of being aggressively protected by its copyright holders and too few people actually caring about it enough to be archived legitimately or illegitimately. And so pretty much the only source that I could find this episode was from the iTunes store, which is useless for my purposes because the DRM protection is so vigorous that I can't even take any goddamn screenshots. But thank you to my Discord mod Lab for finding a version uploaded on YouTube, and because it was blocked in the United States, this segment is sponsored by non-specific VPN. Just kidding, it's sponsored by Cool Shirts. But because this episode seems to be so rigorously copyright protected, I will be presenting it in slideshow format. I hope it was worth it, and frankly, I assume that it will not be. The fruits are practicing their Christmas carols, and the orange keeps messing everything up. I didn't find the style of humor amusing back when it was popular, and I certainly don't now. Orange messes stuff up on purpose. He does a stupid little laugh. He says some random He says a stupid little laugh. And repeat, and repeat, and repeat. And then it turns into another Christmas Carol parody. The orange gets shown his past to prove that he's always been annoying. And then he gets shown how annoying he was that day. And then he's shown how annoying he'll continue to be in the future, which causes all of his friends to commit suicide. Jesus! He returns to caroling practice and promises to be less annoying, and barely restrains himself from making the same joke for the hundredth time in this episode. None of these specials have been agonizing to sit through like this one was. To help me get through the whole thing, I was playing it on increased speed, and it's only an 11 minute episode, but I was still repeatedly checking on that playback bar to see if it was finally over yet. This one's going under the tree. Next, the Looney Tunes Christmas Carol. And you might say, hey, didn't we already do that one? No, 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 that was Bah Humduck. This is a Christmas Carol. It's too hot out even though it's the middle of December, and so Bugs doesn't want to celebrate Christmas, which Lola is horrified by. She vows to go out and put on a show which will get everyone in the holiday spirit, and Bugs suggests that she base it on a Christmas carol. Foghorn Leghorn is some kind of politician and proposes that they build some kind of giant fan on the North Pole to blow the cold air down to them. Lola's theatrical production of A Christmas Carol is less than faithful to the original story because she didn't read it and just imagined up an original story under the assumption that it was about a woman named Carol. And she's less than competent. Everyone except her agrees that the play sucks ass. Meanwhile, Foghorn and Daffy go and install the gigantic North Pole fan and end up stumbling into Santa's workshop while looking for a power outlet. But no, he was just hallucinating and didn't even plug in the fan. It's the night of the play and the theater is packed. Everyone except for Bugs falls through a trap door and he fills in for literally every single role until he falls through too. Santa Claus busts in and says a few words in defense of the awful play and encourages them to celebrate Christmas regardless of the unseasonal heat. And then he falls through the trap door. The city is suddenly covered in snow because Santa plugged in the fan for them before he left. Obligatory musical sequence. I don't like the visuals of this version quite as much. The animation quality is really solid, but I think the Looney Tunes character designs are an if it ain't broke, don't fix it situation. And there's been just a little bit too much fixing here. However, the writing feels much less hollowly zany than the previous Looney Tunes special we saw. It's really clever and funny and made me laugh out loud a few times. As far as Christmas specials go, the biggest problem in this one for me is the one that the characters keep reiterating over and over. It doesn't feel like Christmas. It only turns Christmassy at the very end and could be mistaken for a regular non-Christmas episode for most of the runtime. Although, can I tell you how relieved I am that they didn't do a Christmas Carol parody again? This was probably the most unique take on the concept that they could have had. All things considered, I think this one goes in an upper middle part of the tree. Next up, another episode of Mad with Fantastic Four Christmas. The titular parody sequence of this one is of the Fantastic Four films, I am assuming the ones that came out in 2005 and 2007, because this episode came out in 2012 and Fan 4 Stick wouldn't be out for another couple of years. 
although it also incorporates the comics. Each of them gets their Christmases interrupted by villains, except for The Thing, who brings us one of our extremely few Hanukkah references in this whole marathon. Frosty advocates a diet regimen that hinges on being able to melt in the sun, the characters of The Christmas Carol host a prank show, there's a delightful little stop-motion spy vs. spy, there's another TV show parody that goes directly over my head, but at least all of these are holiday-themed. I'd rather earn my way onto a good show! Ho, 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 ho. Ah, come on. White Collar isn't that bad. Well, I'm not talking about White Collar. <laughs> oh, that one got me. This one goes in the middle. And finally, regular show with the remarkably titled Christmas special. It's a very dramatic action sequence that plays out between this thieving elf and Santa, leading to Santa escaping with the stolen gift and taking several seemingly lethal gunshots on his way down. Back with the main characters, they're all having a Christmas party, and Mordecai and Rigby get sent out to get soda. They see something fall from the sky and crash into someone's garage. They find a gravely injured Santa who's annoyed that they're the first ones to show up, of all people. Dear Santa, dude, give me an invisibility cloak. Santa, dude, don't be a jerk. But he begs them to keep the box safe. It's a box that will grant any desire of the opener, but it's a potent, corrupting force. They bring all the others from the Christmas party over to prove that Santa fell from the sky, but he's gone. A few of them open up the box to verify their claim and fall victim to the thrall. Skips gets the lid back on it again and says that the box is created with dark magic and can't be destroyed by normal means. He leads them to a lava pit where they can throw the box inside, but they get ambushed by the park rangers. Meanwhile, the evil elf is hot on their tail. After the rangers feel the thrall of the box, they beg to be released and make their way to the lava cave. It's intensely booby-trapped. Muscle Man uses his dance skills to thwart the first trap, and Benson uses his pinball skills on the second one, which creates a bridge with just enough time to spare. The third challenge is to wrestle a bear, which Pops defeats despite everybody's expectations. When they finally arrive at the lava pit, the evil elf is waiting for them, having just taken the stairs. Santa's there too and smacks his gun into the lava pit, revealing that he's alive due to wearing a bulletproof vest. The evil elf grabs the box in the commotion and wishes for the end of Christmas. Mordecai shoves him into the pit, going down with him, and Rigby follows them in, battling the elf for the box until they're saved by the intervention of Santa, and the elf and box go plunging into the lava. Santa thanks them for helping him despite his negative expectations, and gifts them that invisibility cloak that they always wanted. This one... this one was... Definitely unusual. It completely defies the general expectation of what a Christmas special is supposed to be. I guess a bit like Die Hard, but slightly more Christmas themed. However, this take on Santa as this hard-ass action hero is something that we've seen a couple times already on this list alone. It's uh, definitely got the highest rate of casualties of any of the ones on this list. There's gun violence, a guy gets lobbed to death, a bunch of cronies have presumably fatal falls. But this um, isn't a metric that's accounted for in this Christmas ranking. I suppose my main feeling about this is bewilderment. Middle branch. Now we've got our festively decorated ranking tree, but which of these specials gets to be the star? I think there's a few clear contenders. The Foster's Home special hits all the checkboxes that it needs to. It's heartfelt and amusing story, the way that its delightful character designs look so nice in the snowy winter setting, and I appreciate the fact that despite most of these stories having some element about traveling to the North Pole and meeting Santa, this one's just about the main cast doing their thing at home holiday style. However, it has a disadvantage in this top three of being the only one that's a standard 22 minute episode. I think Class of 3000's Christmas Special also came out on top in this one. It's already a musically-oriented show, and so its musical interstitials felt highly appropriate instead of just being shoehorned in like most of the ones on this list. And in this one, we get three! The different animation styles on display during these musical breaks is part of what makes this show so memorable, and even though Class of 3000 isn't quite as well known as some of Cartoon Network's other programming, this one will always be a top-tier CN show to me. It's such a love letter to animation and the spirit of creativity in general. The down-to-earth characterization of Santa in this one was also really refreshing. Nearly all of the other Santas had either very traditional mall Santa-like dialogue and behavior, or they were some kind of extreme action movie parody of Santa, and so Class of 3000 Santa, who talks like a normal guy and has a hot blonde wife, was a breath of fresh air in this Christmas special marathon. And rounding out our top three is the Powerpuff Girls Fight Before Christmas. The Powerpuff Girls' adorable mid-century inspired settings look so perfect all covered in snow and holiday decor, and seeing all the ways that their powers are applicable to solving all these mundane wintertime and holiday issues was just a delight. 
Princess Morbux was the perfect villain for this one, and seeing her deception come crashing down by her own nasty character traits was so satisfying. Like, that's right, you're on the permanent naughty list now, you little brat. So many scenes are just burned into my mind. The one where the girls rush to decorate the house, all of them being disappointed by the tree's faulty lighting, this whole ninja scene where Princess sneaks into Santa's workshop, Princess Morbux being literally the only one on the naughty list, Princess finally getting those superpowers she's always wanted, the yellow being added to their glowing streaks across the sky as they race to the North Pole. If only she wasn't so awful because this rainbow they make together looks so wonderful. This special is just perfect scene after perfect scene after perfect scene, and they don't even need a shoehorned in musical sequence because the whole thing carries itself on its own merit. It's a perfect Christmas special, it's a perfect episode of the Powerpuff Girls, it was probably my favorite special to watch out of this whole list, and it's double length, and the version I found has the ads included! Hell yeah! I think despite all three of these specials being wonderful in their own way, this one has a clear winner. Nah, fuck it, it's Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer! Grandpa's gonna sue the pants off for Santa, that's what Grandpa's gonna do! Grandpa's gonna sue the pants off for Santa, cause Grandma would have wanted him to! Thank you to Cool Shirts and all my Patreon supporters for making this video possible. Expect a new Patreon exclusive video around the new year. Special thanks to my Ultra VIPs Khan, Dr. Dream Morella, Fishcatch, Grizzly, Julia, Luca Anastasius, Ms. Goat, Nicole Manassian, and Tara Tara. Okay. Bye. <laughs>